Good afternoon. Thanks very much for having me. All right. There we go. I have nothing to disclose. All right. Well, in terms of diagnosis, um, the challenge, and I'm going to be talking about oral cavity specifically, not oropharynx. Um, so the challenge is an advanced cancer. Obviously, it's a challenge to, to manage, but of course, my daughter, who's 14, could take a look at that image and say, that's not something uh, very good. It's the early lesions and the detection of those and the evaluation of those early lesions that really are important. And this indeed is secondary prevention and indeed almost tertiary prevention when you get into you know, the surveillance of patients who've had oral cancer. And as you examine your patients, you know, and I find this happens to my students, you know, they look, but they don't actually see. And many of you will be able to see the tiger in the middle of the eye. Um, if you didn't see the tiger in the middle of the eye, then it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you, but it just, you know, it suggests that there's more to see in an examination than often meets the eye. So it's very important to, to really have a good technique for examining. And so, you know, I use loops. I use a very good white light um, uh, to image the oral cavity. And of course, I use my fingers. I'm always trying to detect if there's any some submucosal extension to an oral lesion. And so we all, as Terry was saying, we all have a sort of semantics about the, you know, the nomenclature that we use to describe what we see clinically. And there are a number of different clinical diagnoses that we use. And we use that term leukoplakia, which is another term that I wish all of us could get on the same page. It really is a white patch that doesn't wipe off and you can't explain why it's there. And therefore, it initiates a diagnostic algorithm to rule out um, pre-malignant changes or uh, possibly malignancy. And as you go through that spectrum of different clinical uh, you know, appearances, it goes from white to mixed red and white. And I always uh, you know, like to show the Canadian flag. It's a good way of remembering that's a high-risk lesion. Uh, and then moving on to red, the erythroplakia. And obviously, the more red it has in it, the more surface topography. Um, if it's got ulceration in it, then that is more of an ominous-looking appearance. But that doesn't necessarily always reflect what's truly, you know, at the DNA level, at the mutational level. So when we uh, encounter, you know, oral potentially malignant disorders, we have to make a decision. And, you know, it's, we don't have a crystal ball, and we aren't a fly on the roof of the mouth looking at that lesion, watching it change over time. We capture things in a cross-section, so we don't really know what's happening. And so we have to be able to predict at that moment in time, do we need to get a biopsy, do we not? How often should we follow those patients? If it's dysplastic at the time of uh, you know, the biopsy, what does that mean? Well, if it's got more of a high-grade dysplastic diagnosis, then obviously the likelihood for malignant transformation is greater. Is it even a malignancy? And we know that some diseases are progressive, some are almost regressive. How indolent is that disease or how aggressive is it? So these are things that we need to find better answers, chair side. So you, as head and neck oncologists, how do you detect and evaluate abnormal oral mucosal disease? And how do you teach your protégés? Because they're going to listen to what you teach them, and they're going to take that into the world. Now, I really wanted to talk about the adjunctive techniques. Is there a role for adjunctive techniques? So this is, a, you know, what's a diagnostic adjunct? Well, it's a technique applied to an identified lesion which aids in the characterization of the lesion to better identify high-risk lesions, 
or select appropriate regions for further evaluation. Its application should accelerate the pathway to a definitive diagnosis, improve diagnostic accuracy, reduce false negative rates due to sampling error. And maybe in the future, it can also predict um, you know, the nature of that lesion and predict what it's going to do over time. So there are lots of bells and whistles and lights and things like that that we're now exposed to in the marketplace. And many of these ha are untested. Uh, and you can see some of them there. They include the autofluorescence devices, the low energy lights, and um, there are a number of them in the US marketplace and marketed elsewhere in the world. Then there are the vital stains, and the most commonly used vital stain is toluidine blue. But some of the head and neck community are using Lugol's iodine as well. And then there are the cytopathologic adjuncts, and there are a myriad of different brushes that are analyzed in different ways, that are stained in different ways to pick up um, you know, morph morphometric changes or look for other biomarkers. So what's the evidence for all of these? And if you look at the studies, where are they from? And very few of them are from you know, the hands of frontline clinicians, the dentists, the primary care physicians, and you can see the different uh, clinicians. Most of them are done in secondary care, in places where patients are presenting initially with these diseases, and then in tertiary care, where it's really principally a surveillance population. And so you've got to look at where those adjunctive uh, studies are being explored. We are in the middle of doing a Cochrane review. I'm part of a Cochrane review. I'm going to just present some very preliminary data. I can't show you all the different forest plots and everything as yet, but hopefully in 2014, we'll be able to have that um, Cochrane review. And it's entitled Diagnostic Tests for Oral Cancer and Potentially Malignant Disorders in Patients Presenting with Clinically Evident Lesions. So there were about 10,000 studies, more than 10,000 studies, yielded in the search, whittled down to 37 um, studies that were eligible for a meta-analysis. And out of those, 11 were looking at the light-based adjuncts, 14 looking at vital staining, 12 looking at cytology. And there really are none in the domain that were at least eligible at the time when they did the literature review looking at blood and saliva. So let's look at the evidence for the light-based adjuncts accuracy. So out of those 11 studies, the, uh, the pooled uh, sensitivity was pretty high at uh, 90%, and the specificity was very low at 52%. And this is really one of the main problems with you know, the light-based um, adjuncts, particularly things like the low energy light, and that's one of the reasons why that specificity level is so low. So, you know, I, um, you know, we need to do things to help bolster the specificity, and part of it is just having good experience in the use of these technologies. This is the, the Velscope, and I use this routinely in our mucosal disease clinic. And here's a patient who presents with a leukoplakia, and it rather surprised me to show that there was actually a distinct loss in tissue autofluorescence which increased my level of suspicion from a lower to a higher risk. And this was biopsy, and it turned out to be a severe epithelial dysplasia. And here's another patient who had a very small erythroplakia with a little ulceration that turned out to be a microinvasive squamous cell carcinoma. And you can again see that it's maybe a little bit difficult to see on the screen, but you can see that um, significant loss of fluorescence. And so there are a number of head and neck surgeons using this device to help map out the margins for surgical excision. But, um, you know, when you look at this patient who had a mild dysplasia, there really isn't a loss of fluorescence. So I question, is that really a false negative or was that mild dysplastic lesion ever going to be a serious concern for that patient anyway. But there is a leukoplakia there. And then th here's another patient who has an actual squamous cell carcinoma 
but with no real loss in fluorescence. So again, none of these adjuncts are absolutely perfect. You cannot rely on them every single time. And then there are a lot of confounder lesions. So you have to have an experience, a level of experience looking at mucosal diseases. So here's a patient who's an asthmatic inhaling corticosteroids and develops a, an erythematous candidiasis. Well, of course, there is a loss of fluorescence because that light, that blue light, is absorbed by the hemoglobin in an inflammatory lesion. But this is not a neoplastic process. And here's the same. A patient on surveillance for a previous history of squamous cell carcinoma that has lichen planus. And the lichen planus lesion actually it shows up with the loss of fluorescence. So again, you've got to understand the nuances of lichen planus. On to the vital staining. Again, 14 studies, sensitivity about 84%, specificity about 70%. Now, the problem with many of these studies is that you've got to look at the population that they're doing the study on. If the study is done like the Mashberg studies back in the 1980s, they're really looking at very high-grade dysplasias and early carcinomas. The sensitivity and specificity are much higher. But when you get into the lower grade dysplasias or when you get, you know, benign lesions, it's going to be different. So the sensitivity is not going to be as good and the accuracy is not going to be as good. So look at this. This is a squamous cell carcinoma. The whole mouth has been stained, but only the cancer picks it up. The margin can be seen. It looks perfectly normal where the normal mucosa is. Here is that same squamous cell carcinoma that showed up negatively, didn't show a loss of tissue autofluorescence, but has a blatant positive finding to toluidine blue. This patient had seen five clinicians by the time they got to us, put on antibiotics, antifungals, and yet they have a very clear squamous cell carcinoma if you look carefully and then stain it with T blue. Here's another patient, history of radiation treatment for an oropharyngeal cancer, being followed in a head and neck service and has a new malignancy on the uvula. And that was not picked up. And then on a routine visit with our clinic, we picked it up and then you can see the toluidine blue change is astounding. So these are the sorts of things that where you can use these adjuncts um, and they're very helpful. But again, there are false negatives. Here's a case of, again, mild epithelial dysplasia that doesn't pick up the toluidine blue. And then you have to, again, appreciate that all ulcers are going to pick up toluidine blue. So, again, here is a patient with uh, lichenoid um, disease and also the filiform papillae on the dorsal surface of the tongue will pick up the toluidine blue. Lugol's iodine, um, you know, will actually stain normal mucosa and there's a big study going on in the UK at the moment looking at whether or not this will help um, with the, um, margins. This was a slide I got from Dr. Uh, Nagal. What about cytopathology? Sensitivity, 0.88. Specificity, 0.93. So th these studies actually you know, show that they're a fairly good surrogate for histopathology. But unfortunately, you don't get a tissue diagnosis. Um, there is the potential for sampling errors because you're using a small brush, but if you've got a large heterogeneous lesion, you've got to make sure that you sample the representative areas. Otherwise, you may get um, an underdiagnosis. Um, this is the oral CDX, and it's really a Papa Nicolau um, staining of that cytolo cytopathological specimen that shows changes in morphology of those cells. This is a technique out of Canada called the oral advance technique, which actually looks at abnormal, it's a quantitative uh, uh, DNA content um, uh, in the specimen. And they're looking, it's basically looking for deviations in DNA content within the nuclei. So this is sort of a ploidy analysis. And there's a nice little study that's published by Samson Ning um, in 2012. So what about these adjuncts um, used in combination? Well, I think that there's something to be said for this because each one has its own positive aspect and combined, you know, we can help increase the sensitivity and specificity.
So um, here are some examples of how we might use this. This is a patient with a heterogeneous lesion. You're asking yourself, well, where would I do the clinical biopsy based on the normal white-like e examination alone? Well, when you look at the loss of fluorescence and the toluidine blue, it really gives you a bit more of an idea where you can hone in and capture the worst um, histopathology in the area. And here's another example of a small leukoplakia. And again, you ask yourself, well, where would I biopsy? Or I probably would just do an excisional biopsy. But what's interesting is you can see that the worst part of that lesion is actually at the inferior aspect. But you can see a larger area which maps out the margins of the disease with the tissue autofluorescence. Mapping multifocal disease. These patients who have proliferative verrucous leukoplakia are a nightmare to follow up with because they have multifocal disease. How do you, you know, follow them up? You don't want to do too many biopsies. And so are there ways to facilitate that surveillance process? So I use some of these uh, adjunctive techniques to monitor them over time. So there's lots of interesting future technologies that are coming down the pike. And some of them are different and novel visualization um, adjuncts, in vivo microscopy, high resolution microendoscopy, optical coherence tomography, narrowband imaging, you know, it goes on and on. So if you look at the literature, there's lots of action going on in this area. And so, um, you know, the concept of the live biopsy, I think, is going to be reality in our um, careers. I like this high-resolution microendoscopy. It's a little easier to handle because it's a smaller probe. More studies need to be done in this domain. The same with optical coherence tomography. And again, mixing some of these adjuncts with some of the more traditional adjuncts may be very helpful. And here is a study that, uh, you know, that I was involved with that um, is, look, is a new sort of cytopathologic platform. And the idea being is it's going to be a lab on a chip such that you could eventually take a little cytopathologic specimen, put it into a little box, and in within 20 minutes, it will have stained all of the cells, done a bunch of analyses on the morphometrics, and also looked at specific biomarkers, and then spew out a result that can help dictate you know what you're going to do next with this lesion. So conclusions, no adjunctive technique has perfect accuracy. Experience in managing oral mucosal diseases will bolster specificity by eliminating confounders. And combinations of adjuncts may improve accuracy. And the future, real-time, non-invasive techniques that identify and facilitate monitoring of high-risk lesions, high-risk patients that, and that may even be coupled with chemotherapeutics that can help eradicate the lesions. So I think we've got an exciting future ahead, and thank you very much.